Again, this is the supplemental class uh, saw on Psalm 119, and we're getting in verse 25. My soul cleaveth unto the dust, quicken, quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me, teach me thy statutes. Make me understand the way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for the heaviness, strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove me from the way of, of, of lying, and grant me thy way, thy, excuse me, grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth, thy judgments ha have I laid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord, put me not to shame. Now, he begins here looking at verse uh, 25. Uh, before we go any further, does everybody else have audio and video? I think before you didn't have it because I left trying to correct some things. If you don't have it, let me know. Uh, but our first point is a person must be spiritually alive in verse 25. He says, My soul cleaveth unto the dust, quicken thou me according to thy word. Uh, now, he has here cleave means to glue to, glue to or to uh, stuck to. Uh, dust means either the earth or the low base or worldly things. Uh, one must not allow his affections to be, to be glued to earthly things. Uh, so my soul cleaveth unto the dust, quicken thee, and quicken thou me according to thy word. Uh, so don't be glued, as, as Brother Patterson points out here, don't be glued to the word of God. Or excuse me. <laughs> Be glued to the Word of God. Don't be glued to earthly things. We cannot afford to be asleep. We must be. Uh, we must uh, wake up. And you pass here, First uh, uh, Thessalonians, First uh, Thessalonians, chapter five, and verse six. Which says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So don't be asleep, but be what? Be focused upon uh, spiritual things, not worldly things. Uh, you know, sometimes we we have those who think that uh, if we're not in the Bible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or that if we don't read the Bible as much as they think we should, or if we don't understand as much as they do about the Bible, because maybe uh, we, in reality, maybe we don't have just the understanding or the ability yet to understand or grasp a concept or a teaching, uh, doesn't mean a person is not doing their very best to learn about God. Uh, you know, different people, of course, we have to make a living in this life, so we have to work. We have to pr provide for our children. We have to teach our children. We have to help others do all the, and do all these other works of a Christian. But doesn't, and now of course that doesn't mean we don't say the word of God. But sometimes I think uh, we have few who forget that we have other things we have to take care of as well. Not that the word of God isn't uh, important to us, but we have to make sure. But we have to do other things as well. So we have some uh, sometimes we encounter that have the attitude, well, you know, I study, you know, so many hours a day. I've been looking at this for so many years. And uh, sometimes it's those who are, and this isn't always the case, so don't, I'm not trying to make a blanket statement at all. Uh, but sometimes we have those who, who uh, act or act or some, well, some will just tell you uh, that because they've studied something for so many years that uh, their conclusion is correct. And a person as young as uh, some of us, not necessarily me, because I've been called old, though I'm not old yet, uh, when I get old, I'll be sure to tell you. But uh, they, some will act as if the well length of time determines a, a person's an ability to understand something, uh, which isn't true even in the Bible. You know, Paul, or excuse me, Saul, before he became the Apostle Paul, uh, was very educated and uh, was very knowledgeable. Yet after many, many years, he, he was very uh, clearly told by meeting Christ in the road to Damascus that he was wrong. Uh, so we have to make sure that we make time to study God's word, but also realize, help others have to realize sometimes that 
Uh, we still have to do other things as well in this life. We have to make a living and provide, but we should be focused on God's word. And when we get in God's word, be focused upon it and not approach it in a half-hearted uh, type of attitude. Uh, that's my mini sermon for this evening. Like we need more things to take away from our study. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 <clears throat> says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and, and spiritual understanding. Excuse me. So we must be filled with spiritual understanding. We must be sp filled with the knowledge of God. Now, as the Old Testament bears out, the secret things belong to God. I don't believe we could possibly know every single thing in the Bible and understand every single aspect. Because if you do, if you can do that, if you have that ability, then I would love to sit down and talk with you about the book of Revelation and some other passages. But we, what we have to realize is we have to make sure that we are doing our very best to fill our minds with spiritual things and the things that are pleasing to God, one of them being, as we're talking about this evening, the knowledge of his word. And that doesn't mean that uh, we can't enjoy other things, but, you know, spiritual things, things that are pleasing to God must be uh, at the forefront of our lives. He says there next, take, to take advantage of every spiritual benefit and blessing, we must be in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3 tells us that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Uh, come on now. Ephesians chapter 1. In verse uh, 3, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. So if we're going to be blessed by Christ, we have to be in Christ. In Galatians 3, verse 27 tells us, How does a person uh, become in Christ? When you're baptized, you're placed into the body of Christ. Whereas being as you're baptized into Christ, to put on Christ. Uh, so in order to be have part of those spiritual blessings a person must be baptized so they can have uh, placement into the body of Christ and then receive these spiritual blessings that are only in Christ. Uh, pretty logical sense there, uh, though not everyone agrees with that, but obviously the Bible teaches very clearly that the uh, only way to receive those spiritual blessings is to be in Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to be carnally minded, carnally minded as the King James puts it, is really the idea of just being, you're, you're focused on worldly things constantly. Now you're not worldly minded if you don't pick up your Bible and study six hours a day or whatever uh, every day. You're worldly minded when you're focused on worldly things and the Bible and God and the church and all those things are the last things on your mind. They're the things you think about on Sunday and if they're lucky on Wednesday night, but another time. That type of mentality is a person who's, who is not trying to do their very best to learn about God because we have to make realize that we have to learn about the Word of God at other times. We can't just rely on Bible class teachers, preachers, and elders, and deacons. Uh, we must ourselves sit down and read the Word of God and so that we can learn from it because it is the way to eternal life. Uh, the next point here, verse 26 of Psalm 119, he has must, one must be prayerful. Uh, it is only when we are completely open with our life to God that he hears. Now, if you look at uh, he has here Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, uh, which says, After this manner, therefore pray ye. So he, he gives what we call sometimes a model prayer, or, or, uh, an example of how a person could pray. And I've always thought uh, that if you just remove the, the section that says, uh, thy kingdom come, because today we know that his kingdom has come, which is the church, that there's no reason you could not say or say any of those other things in the prayer. Now we could even, we might even say, instead of saying thy kingdom come, we might say we are thankful that your kingdom has come. Uh, but 
you look at verse 9, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be, be thy name. So our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. You are holy. Nothing wrong saying any of those things in the prayer. Perhaps it says saying thy kingdom come, because now we're past tense, the kingdom has come. Uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are thankful for thy kingdom. And what? We, are, we pray that your will continue to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And nothing wrong with any of those things. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need this day to, to do or accomplish whatever task we need to accomplish. And forgive us our debts or our sins, as we forget our debtors or those who have sinned against us. And let us not into temptation, verse 13, but deliver us from evil. Some uh, versions say the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. So do not let us into temptation. Of course, God does not cause anyone to be tempted, but deliver us from evil. So you must say, uh, prevent us from, from going into temptation, but deliver and the, deliver us from evil. That is, help us overcome evil or avoid evil, avoid uh, sin. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So the Lord's kingdom is has power and is in power. And it is glory, glorious, and it will last forever. Again, none of those things uh, will, will be wrong to say today in a prayer, so long as we made sure we made a proper uh, adaption to the phrase, thy kingdom come, because the kingdom has come. But So we must be prayerful, careful, uh, consider the teaching of Christ, as he says here in Matthew chapter 6. You know, his prayer is a very selfless prayer. It's not a selfish one. It's not a one of saying, I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I need. The first thing he does in verse 9 is he does what? Well, he, he, he puts his focus upon God. Our Father, which art in heaven, holy is your name. He is giving what? He's giving God his due, his glory. He is not coming to saying, God, I want or I need something. He's saying, God, who, who is in heaven, which is the only God, of course, you are holy or holy is your name. Uh, and he goes on, let her see there, a righteous man can depend on the Lord hearing him. He has here John chapter 9 and verse 31. John 9 and verse uh, 31, uh, which says, Now when, now we know that, that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now, we talked about this some here this past Sunday on, on this topic. Uh, I was teaching a class uh, Sunday morning, and I'll finish it probably on uh, next Sunday. Uh, we're looking at Psalm 5, uh, those 12 verses, and in a 45-minute class, I covered seven, seven of them. Uh, so we'll finish the rest next week. But he knows what he says here. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't know the person is praying or that a person has needs. What, what we have to remember is, is that God is not going to answer their prayers. He's not going to give, give them uh, any type of, uh, he's not going to answer their prayer any way other than him acknowledging that they are praying or they are, are speaking or trying to speak to him. Because why? Because God is not going to respond to a person who is disobedient to him, a sinner, it's a person who's disobedient to him. Now, we also have to, of course, remember that uh, when he says here, God heareth not sinners, we know that all men all have sinned and all short of the glory of God, and that even as Christians we commit sin. So when we have to re realize this, he's not talking about Christians who committed sin, that God won't hear their prayers for, for forgiveness, because that's not what's taught in the Bible. What's, as we see uh, also in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, is that our sin is what separates man from God. God never leaves man, but sin pushes God, uh, pushes ourselves away from God, and God still is waiting for us to repent of those sins, and those sins are removed out of the way, and we can come back and draw near to Him. So the person who, the sinner who's, whose prayer God will not hear is the person who we call sometimes an alien sinner, a person who has never come to Christ, who has never been uh, obeyed God's, obedient to God's uh, gospel plan of salvation. God does not hear their prayer. And if God does not hear the prayer of a, of a sinner or an alien sinner, then that helps us realize, of course, from Isaiah 59, verse 2, John 9, 31, and other verses as well, 
that such a prayer like, as like a sinner's prayer cannot be heard by God because that is not, the Bible tells us God does not hear that hear a prayer by a person who has never come to him. He does, however, hear the prayers of a Christian who has committed sin, desires to repent, to have themselves made right again in his sight. God hears his prayer. Uh, the uh, first, uh, the uh, books of John, first, second, third John, uh, talk about how if we will pray to him, we know that he hears us, and he will he'll forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all uh, unrighteousness. Now I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, but so the prayer that's not being heard is a prayer of an alien sinner, but the prayer of a person who is a obedient Christian, uh, he has obediently obeyed the gospel, but has sinned because we're not perfect. We do make mistakes. Someone does something uh, ignorant that upsets us. We, we respond in a way that's not uh, correct or, or Christian-like. Uh, we have to repent of those things, so we're not perfect. And God hears the prayers of a Christian, of a New Testament Christian. And we know that because we see as we continue on in verse 31, but if, he, if, if any man be a worshiper of God, that is, if he be obedient, a servant of God, and doeth his will, there's tells us again, who's he talking about? Him he heareth. So he doesn't hear sinners, but he hears a worshiper of God, and a person who does his will. He doesn't hear the alien sinner. He hears the Christian who has sin made a mistake him he hear so that what so that their sin can again be removed or be remitted and as we go through this we begin to see again why this class is obviously going to be a two-part class psalm 34 and verse 15 because as a preacher sometimes you can't be quite long enough to move on to the next verse uh, Psalm 34, verse 15, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Another verse to talk about what we just said a moment ago. And because I went on at length, I'm going to move right along. Uh, letter C, our next main point, letter C, one must be a student, that is, a student of the Bible. And I've said this in other classes. I'm not sure if I said it in this class or not. Uh, sometimes when we, when we hear the phrase, a student, a student of the Bible, which is what he's talking about here, uh, we think, well, that has to be a preacher or, or, or a preaching school student. Well, that's not what the case at all. A Bible student or a student of the Bible is a person who studies God's Word and, and desires to apply it to their lives each and every day. That's, that's what a Bible student is. It's not, it doesn't have to be a student at a Bible school or or, or a OBS student, a student of the Bible is a person who studies the Word of God. That's a Bible student. Uh, he must have the attitude of, I want to learn. Implied is a teach, is a teacher. It should say teacher, not teach. A student in a curriculum, which of course is the Word of God. Verse 27, one must open one's mouth. He must do this to influence others. Remember the Lord's method is teaching. That is, we have to speak out and reach out to others we cannot just you know do nothing we have to do what we can to reach out to others by teaching the one who wins souls is wise proverbs 11 verse 30. Uh, we'll look at that quickly which i believe says just about that word for word the fruit of the, of the righteous is a tree of life and he that wins souls is wise so there you go uh the next point letter e one must have a compassionate heart uh, verse 28 of Psalm 119, one must have a compassionate heart. Think of how many times he says here, the Lord wept. John 11, 35, Luke 19, 41. One terrible thing wrong with our world is that too, that too many, that should be too, too many, do not have compassion. And he references Luke 10, 33, 1 Peter 3, 8, 1 John 3, 17. So let's look at at least one or two of these before we move on. Luke 33, excuse me, Luke 10, 33. Alex, P-R or what? Oh, Proverbs, what? Okay, Proverbs 11, 30. Proverbs 11, 30. Uh, I emailed you guys that PowerPoint if you, uh, if you had a chance to check. I may not check that during class, but uh, you, have, you do have that in your email. Um, also, I think... This gives me, let's try something here. Okay. You guys should have got 
this offers the ability to share a file with you guys through through here, I guess. And uh, let me know if you got any kind of little notification about that. I sent you the PDF that I'm reading from this evening. And of course, like I always say, our, my PDF or our outline is always the same as the PowerPoint. It's just the outline is in a PowerPoint format. So, um, what was, where was I? Luke 10. You got okay. Luke 10:33. Uh, maybe that would be easier. That way, you guys don't have to open up your email. Uh, Luke 10, 33, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came, came, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard today to be compassionate every single time when if you're at the church building, the phone rings, and you have someone who's needing help, or someone comes in the door of the church building at the end of a lesson wanting help. Especially after you know you saw their car when you pulled in, they've stayed out there the whole time and just didn't come in at all to the very end. Uh, different reasons why it's hard sometimes to be compassionate to those who are in need. Uh, you know, it, it, I enjoy helping those in need. Uh, the problem I, I find is that we have a lot of folks today who really aren't in need, they're in want. They have misplaced their priorities. You know, someone comes to the church building and and you know they have uh, cartons of cigarettes in their car, and I've heard the the illustration of the story of a of a preacher having a individual come to the church building. He had two cartons of cigarettes in, in his back seat. I don't know what year this was. I'm sure if they did that now, that's a lot of money. Looking at packs of cigarettes, they're between four and six dollars, and four is probably the cheap stuff. Uh, but you think about having two cartons of cigarettes and the individual came to the building and wanted some food and so the preacher went and got you know two uh sacks of food for, for the person and brought it out and he saw he had cartons of cigarettes in his back seat and he talked to him about it a little bit then he he said i'll give you these two bags of groceries for your two cartons of cigarettes now of course the cartons of cigarettes uh probably worth more than the groceries that he got had in the sack well, the man wasn't willing to do it. He'd rather have his cigarettes. So he went away with his cigarettes without any food. And, uh, you know, it's sad that the people do that, but, you know, you have to, what, what we try to help people understand is you have to get your priorities right. And it's hard to tell, to help someone in need when they're really not in need, they have just misplaced their priorities. You know, someone come to the church building and, and having alcohol or tobacco or, or all these other things in your vehicle they're spending money on that is not what they actually need and they come and they ask for food. Uh, it's very hard to help them. Uh, had an individual come up to the church building here uh, a few years ago or a year ago. Uh, he has since passed up, passed away as I heard about as well. But he came up and he had cigarettes and he had, I think he not even had one tucked behind his ear and he was asking me for, for spam. And uh, you know, you gotta be pretty hard up for you must be really hungry if you like if you want to expand in my opinion i just kind of stay away from that anything that makes that sound come out of can i'm going to stay away from anyway uh that's what he wanted so i, I just went inside and grabbed him a couple cans and came back out and i told him i looked him out i said no you could afford a lot more than spam if you would knock off smoking those cigarettes and well he just kind of glared at me and walked away but we had to show compassion on people you know i didn't send him away hungry but I did tell him, you know, that there's better ways, there's a way to solve that problem. But anyway, now Luke, we looked at Luke 10, 33, where Christ was compassionate. Let's look um, at the next verse. Let's look at 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. Is that right? Yes, 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. Which says... Come on, computer. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion on, com having compassion, one of another. Love as brethren. Be, be pitiful. Be courteous. You know, I am thankful for so many members of the church today who are very compassionate. They are very giving. You know, we have a congregation. Uh, I could use us as an example, but but I won't. You have congregations where I've been, other congregations that are small, where people just they give and give and give, not just financially, 
but of their time, of, of, of their uh, giving away, you know, donations to people, uh, doing all types of things, and they just give and give and give and give. And, you know, the Lord, no doubt, is well pleased with that. A person who is uh, not just because they're giving of their funds or of their time or of their work or their talent, whatever their case may be, but because, uh, you know, we can do all those things and still be wrong inside of God if our attitude is wrong. You know, if we are grinding our teeth and we're putting in our, our funds into, into the contribution plate, uh, the Lord's not pleased with that. Uh, to me, it's almost you, might, you almost might as well just hang on to it. It's not pleasing to God. Uh, the Lord is not going to want that uh, given to him. He wants the best. He doesn't want you grinding your teeth when you do so. But having compassion uh, one of another, love as brethren. Be pitiful. Uh, be courteous. You know, we have those today. And I say today because, you no, know, I haven't been on this earth in the time of the Great Depression. And, uh, uh I've, I, one of my favorite movies is a movie called Cinderella Man, uh, which uh, there's a few scenes where they use some words I wish they wouldn't. But it's placed during the time period of the Great Depression. And I watch that movie sometimes, and boy, you know, they're they're tough. They're, they're, they're strong. The things they endured, uh, I, you know, people may t complain about this being a, a recession. Uh, you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm not very yellow, but I know this is an ethane, that things could be a whole lot worse. Uh, you know, I think if the Lord wasn't compassionate, we'd probably find out real quick what a real depression really is. But nonetheless, he says, your love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, and we should help those who are in need, and especially this time period we have brothers and sisters who have lost their jobs, or are losing their jobs, losing their homes. The best thing the church can do to show love is to be courteous to them, help them in any way that they can, if they're able to do so. You know, some smart congregations, because members have lost their jobs, their contributions have gone down, therefore what they can do has, has shrunk as well. But we should be courteous, be pitiful, as he says here, having compassion one of another or for one another. Okay, next let's look at uh, letter F. One must live right. This is the base of all human character, verse 29. Excuse me. Lying is put put for apostasy, irreligion, and any departures, excuse me, any departures from God. Our horror, horror should always be that we might live a lie. And he has here... Uh, Second Thessalonians two oops come on two verse ten through verse twelve. Lord really next week we won't have this many these many problems, we'll move a lot smoother. I keep saying that, but week after the week there's been something that hasn't worked out like I want it to. First Thessal or second Thessalonians two, ten through twelve, and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion and they should believe a lie. They all might be damned to believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, when I read, when I read those last two verses, 11 and 12, those are some ideas, some, some points that really it almost, it's really almost sends chills up my spine to think about those who are doing exactly that. Here at this congregation, I've been doing a series of lessons on why I'm a member of the Church of Christ in the evening. I'm sure most of us here in this class who are watching this, uh, many of you <clears throat> have probably read the book, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ by Leroy Brown, or maybe read the another book, which I use as well. I get some titles sometimes from books. I don't necessarily use their information because uh, if I did so, well, first, it wouldn't be right unless I gave them credit. But second of all, everyone's preaching style is so much different. Uh, most of the time, I just get an idea from their title and I go from there. But uh, I lost my train of thought. While well, I remember the Church of Christ by Leroy Brown or Introducing the Church of Christ, um, I'm trying to find who, who compiled this. Uh, from Star Bible Publications, um, as a forward by Alvin Jennings, but there's our, uh, okay, well, each section is written by different people, 
So there's a whole different host, whole host of people, and there's 51 topic, 52 topics. Well, I'm not, I didn't do a 52 lesson uh, sermon series. I think we're just getting to to lesson um, 13 this next week. Uh, that's not including some lessons I broke up into three different parts because we talked about worship. Nonetheless, you look at this last those last two verses, and I'll get to the point I'm making here quickly. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. They should believe a lie, that they might be damned to believe not the truth, but a pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, sometimes when we hear that phrase, pleasure in unrighteousness, we think, well, they had pleasure in doing worldly things. Uh, you have a first edition. I bet that's, that might be... Uh, pretty uh might be worth something now if we sell that on ebay but um pleasure and righteousness also in my mind maybe it's because i've been i've been comparing for some lessons coming up those who have pleasure in denominational type of uh, preaching or denominational type of teaching and what i mean by this is the last couple lessons we're doing here probably the last two uh place article or or uh, ads in the paper, ads around town, putting them up at stores and things, asking people, really begging people for their questions and their concerns that they have about the Church of Christ. And I, I, I put out that I'm going to uh, answer those in two lessons on, on Sunday evening after we get some responses. I, I have a few, but there's a series of lessons that a Baptist preacher did last November, uh, November 2012, or 13 rather. I think that's right. Maybe it's 2012. Anyway, and he did a series of lessons on the Church of Christ, and I will tell you, it's interesting the spin, the way that the spin is put on the Church of Christ, and and the, the things he said. And I could have a whole series of lessons on things he said, but he talked about, and he's talked, he continued to talk about. I'm not even through them yet. I think there's six lessons that he did, and I'm on number four uh, because we hear so much, how so many misapplications, and so many things are just doesn't understand or know really what the true history of the church is. Sometimes you're in a big hurry to go back and listen to some of that stuff. But anyway, he talked about how the denominational, the, the reason denominations are, are present is because the prayer that Christ gives in the book of John was not a prayer, it was not a request of us to be united or to try to unite everyone to one church. But it was, in, it was his prayer that God would unite everyone. And that our goal is simply to go out and to preach the gospel. That we're not to be united. And when I listened to that, I, I think my mouth fell open and probably hit my desk when I heard that. I couldn't believe it. Because what, what does the Bible say? It tells us to what? To, we all be what? Like-minded. We are to be what? Of one faith, one, one baptism, all those types of things. And be it. He used the idea of denominations, saying that the uh, reason we have so many divisions today in groups is so we have different people can be can be met where they are with these different denominations. Someone has these other ideas or other feelings towards things, so there's this domination for them. How ridiculous! And you look at verse twelve, that they might all be that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure pleasure in unrighteousness. To me, that fits what this preacher was talking about or what he is actually believing and teaching. As we see in verse 11, they should believe a lie, a strong delusion. Okay, um, that was 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. We are on verse 30. We'll do, we'll see if we can't get through at least, okay. Yeah, we're almost done with this first part of it. Okay. Uh, one must make truth his choice, verse 30. In this verse, in the one above, Psalm 119, verse 29, and Psalm 119, verse 30, the way of lies, treachery, and the way of faithfulness, perseverance in the truth, stand in opposition to one another. That is what they are completely contradictory. They do not, uh, you know, they don't go get in the same sentence. Uh, faithfulness and law and the way of lies. He says loyalty to truth must be one's first, excuse me, first priority. You know, you think about that, and again, this my mind just goes back to these lessons I've been listening to this guy, and he and hearing and what's sad. I don't mean to say he's the only one, 
because he's not, obviously. Or I don't mean to say that necessarily all denominational teachers and preachers believe and feel the same way that he does. Uh, but you look here, he says, loyalty to truth must be one's first priority. Well, you think about that, and we, I listen to this other gentleman speaking, his loyalty is not the truth. He even talks about working with other quote denominations and and how they can do so many different things together, but they couldn't worship together because they do things so differently. You know, you think about that for a moment. If you can't worship God with the same with these same people you're working with, isn't there something wrong with that? If you can't worship the God who, who sent his son to die on the cross so he could save your your wretched soul, but you worship him so much differently that you can't worship together. There's a problem with that, and it should be glaringly obvious. But it's not when you're blinded and you're not, you don't have a love for the truth, as we saw back in 2 Thessalonians. Okay, our last point for, for this section and for tonight. One must stick to the word, verse 31 and 32 of Psalm 119. We must, as he says here, cleave. I don't know if that's what I put. It looks like cleat. Uh, cleave to the, to the teaching of God as one glued to his wife. I like the idea of being glued to your wife. Uh, the men probably will laugh at that. Ladies may not really like the idea of being glued together. You know, sometimes ladies are called the old ball and chain. Uh, that's not really the correct attitude or response. It's a little funny if your wife thinks it's funny. Otherwise, I wouldn't advise it. But he says, one must cleave to the teaching of God as one glued to his wife. Being glued to your wife here is not the idea of being negative, but the idea that you're you're glued to her because why? You're faithful for her. You love her. You're 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 being true to her. All those things. And he says, and he puts in quotes, I will run, shows the vigorous and even cheerful determination of one who is in the way of God. The cheerful determination of one who is in the way of God. He is happy to be seeking to learn more about God. You know, so many times they hear people say, well, church is so boring. It's, you know why it's, you think it's boring? It's not because there's not things there to entertain you. It's because your mind is not right. If you worry about being entertained, then yes, things are going to be probably boring. But if you're not worried about being entertained, if you realize you're going to be entertained, that you should go home or go somewhere else. But if you're willing to, if your interest is learning about the Word of God, you're not being bored. I remember uh, going, when I still do, when I go to these different lectureships and gospel meetings, I'm excited to be there because I want to hear the person speak. I want to hear what they say. I want to learn about the Word of God, and it's not boring to me. I am excited. Going to, uh, I remember I did a lecture or spoke on a lectureship in uh, South Carolina before I moved back here uh, uh, for, for a graduation at a preaching school. And I remember I was excited. I was fired up. I was ready to go. It wasn't boring to me. I was excited because of what I was going to be. The lesson I was going to bring forth, and because I could help show others what I have learned to help them grow in the Word of God as well. So it's not boring. It should be exciting for us in a in the in a right way. Okay, we're going to stop.